Okay, I see our attendees filtering in here from the, uh, the waiting room. We'll give everybody a couple of minutes to get, get up and running here. Great, and, and I see our panelists are, are all on. Chairman Smith, welcome. Good to have you here. Good to see you, thanks for having me. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and we've got Matt Bergman and General Waldhauser. Uh, so we're, we're just about ready to go. Uh, I'm going to give folks just a couple more minutes to come in from the, uh, the waiting room. We've got about 50 participants right now and, and uh, likely will go up a little bit more. Uh, I'll, a couple of housekeeping notices here. Uh, you are on the American Security Projects web webinar on uh, Africa security and development. Uh, and we are excited to have you here. Um, for, your, for the attendees, uh, you'll see that you, uh, you are not able to uh, unmute yourself or speak, but you are able to ask questions uh, directly. Please use the Q&A button for that, not the chat tab. Uh, this event is on the record. We are recording it. Uh, I am the uh, Chief Operating Officer of the American Security Project. For those of you who haven't been with us before, we are a nonpartisan national security think tank uh, founded about 15 years ago by a bipartisan group of senators, former senators, and retired senior military officers. They thought, uh, and I think it's, it's as important now as it was then, uh, they thought that we needed to get our national security conversation in the United States away from short-term thinking, political point scoring, and get back to the long-term national interests of the country. And that, that means that thinking about the long-term challenges that, that our country faces and also the long-term uh, opportunities that we face. Uh, our work on uh, the American relationship with Africa fits into the long-term opportunities uh, place, we think. For too long, you know, the, the U.S. relationship with Africa has been seen of through a counterterrorism lens. And instead, we need to start thinking about the, the relationship with the whole continent as, a, uh, as an opportunity here. This is the fastest growing uh, region in the world and is expected to continue to be that. Uh, we need to, to start thinking about it in that way. Uh, to talk more about this, I'm going to turn it over to um, Matt Bergman, uh, ASP's board member here. Uh, Matt is an attorney, philanthropist, and entrepreneur based in Seattle. Uh, he's, uh, he, he's been active in politics at the state and national level for 40 years and is a disciple of Scoop Jackson. Uh, he's worked to promote a close U.S.-Israel relationship and mobilize American political support across uh, for the Solidarity Movement in Pol Poland, Black Trade Unions in South Africa, and, and more. After um, Bergman was a, uh, has maintained a keen interest in um, African issues, in 2008, he founded the Maasai Children's Initiative, which established two girls' schools to remote Maasai communities in Southern Kenya. This program included solar-powered computer labs, clean drinking water, school feeding programs and cultural programs that serve 350 girls and the surrounding community. Uh, Matt, I'm gonna leave you to introduce our, our esteemed uh, panelists here. Well, you, you all will have a conversation for about 30 minutes. Uh, you can uh, take questions from the audience or uh, go however you want. Matt, over to you. Well, thank you. Uh, you know, the journalist Richard Dowden has described Africa as a land of altered states and ordinary miracles. Africa draws us in with its many complexities and nuances. It's a continent with tremendous opportunities and, and very daunting challenges. Uh, there are, Africa has seen and sees some of the most profound acts of generosity and human kindness, as well as some of the more horrific acts of, of brutality. It, it's a continent of high hopes and deep despair. But the more time any of us spends in Africa, the, the more inspired we are by the courageous resilience of the African people and the depth and beauty of, of its many cultures and diverse cultures. Africa has emerged in the last decade or so as a much more central to US strategic decision-making. 
uh, in the flattening world with the growing economy in Africa, uh, Africa is emerging as more important economically in a growing world economy. Uh, as, as a repository of many natural resources, Africa is very important toward uh, the overall world economy. Uh, sadly, Africa has, it remains in some areas a source of external terrorist threat as well as internal counterinsurgency. And we have been seeing in more recent years kind of a resurgence of great power competition that had waned since the cold years of the Cold War. So in today's program, we're going to draw on the past experience of our distinguished panelists to provide some guidance and some insight into the strategic challenges and diplomatic opportunities uh, that America is going to face in Africa in the future. And we're honored to have as our panelists, uh, Congressman Adam Smith and General Thomas Waldhauser. Um, Adam Smith is uh, the boy wonder of Washington politics. Uh, he was elected to the Washington Not Senate. anymore, Matt, but I do appreciate it. <laughs> <the Senate. laughs> uh, uh, Congressman Smith was elected to the Washington State Senate in 1990 at the age of 25, the youngest uh, uh, state senator ever elected. Uh, in 1996, he was elected to the uh, U.S. House of Representatives, 9th Congressional District, uh, and has been reelected uh, 11 times. Uh, he currently chairs the House Committee on Armed Services. And Congressman Smith and I came, to, came of age in Washington politics at about the same time in the 1970s, when our politics was do dominated by legislative heavyweights, um, Warren G. Magnuson, Maggie, and Henry Scoop Jackson. And Maggie used to say, and, and Adam really is a true disciple of, of these two uh, uh, legislative powerhouses. Maggie would always say to me or anyone else that in, in, in the Senate there's, and in Congress, there's two types of, of legislators. Uh, workhorses and show horses. And Congressman Smith is firmly in the former category. Uh, he's willing to take on complex issues, work across party lines, forge consensus, and solve problems. He's a pragmatic problem solver that eschews bromides and political rhetoric. Uh, Scoop Jackson would tell me and anybody else who would listen uh, that, well, that partisan politics stops at the water's edge. And Congressman Smith has throughout his congressional uh, career embodied that principle. Uh, he is, is chairman of the House Armed Services Committee. He works with the administration and with uh, Republicans across the aisle to forge consensus and to try to build a bipartisan view on how to challenge the very significant strategic and military challenges that the United States faces around the world. Uh, and at all times, in all ways, and in all matters, uh, Congressman Smith puts the United States national, and national interests and our democratic values ahead of partisan politics. Uh, General Thomas Waldhauser was commissioned in the United States Marines in 1976. He served as an infantry, infantry officer at all levels of the United States Marine Corps, including command of the 15th Marine Expeditionary Unit during combat operations in Afghanistan and Iraq. His general officer commands included the Marine Corps Warfighting Laboratory, Marine Expeditionary Force and Commander of the Marine, Force, Marine Corps Forces in the United States Central Command. Uh, General Waldhauser's Flag Officer Joint Assignments include Chief of Staff, U.S. Special Operations Command, and Senior Military Assistant to the Secretary of Defense. Uh, in, 19, in 2016, General Waldhauser became the fourth commander of the U.S. Africa Camp Command, uh, which encompasses all 54 countries in the African continent, with the exception of Egypt. And during his tenure as head of Af Africa Command, uh, General Waldhauser was responsible for overseeing sensitive training, counter-terrorist, and counter-insurgency -insurg efforts in a highly challenging military and political environment, and, and during a period when there were significant anti-terrorist and counter-insurgency mission missions. And in, in 2019, uh, General Waldhauser uh, retired from his service as African Command, as a, as a head of the Africa Command. So with these distinguished panelists, I'd like to kind of throw the first question out to, to both of you, uh, Congressman Smith and, and General Waldheiser. What, what do each of you view as the largest strategic challenges the United States faces in Africa today? And on the other side, what are the greatest diplomatic opportunities for potential cooperation with African uh, countries in the future? Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and start. And it's great to see you, General Waldhauser. Appreciate working with you during your, your time in service. It's uh, nice to see you again. Um, 
Well, let's start with the opportunities. I mean, I think the obvious opportunity, well, not obvious, but the big opportunity is that the massive growth that's going on in Africa and the economic possibilities there and the positive relationships that the U.S. can have. Um, I think building on those relationships to improve our economic um, cooperation is an enormous opportunity for our country and also to help Africa grow and continue to develop. And I think we should stay focused on, on the continent for, for that reason, if for no other. And I think, you know, we can build the relationships within, within Africa that can help us in a variety of different ways. But I, I view Africa as, a, as an emerging and growing power on the world scene and therefore a place where it's, it's good to have as many friends as possible and the U.S. should be actively engaged. And um, the challenges are, are many. Um, the, the two that the leap to mind are the great power competition issue and the efforts by both China and to a lesser and arguably more pragmatic degree Russia um, to be involved in the region at the same time that China and Russia have aggressively decided to take us on uh, to basically view the world as what's good for the U.S. is bad for them. They are playing heavily in Africa. Um, and, you know, we need to be in there to protect our own interests against the in influence of China and Russia. And then, yes, transnational terrorist groups, you know, continue to be a threat. Now, you know, we, we've contained that threat by and large. And I know some sort of look at that containment and say, well, then we don't really need to worry about it. Um, hasn't been, been that big a problem for a while. But as General Waldhouse together know, that that's not an accident. There, there's an enormous amount of work that has gone on in Somalia um, and certainly also in West Africa. Um, I was, you know, right before the break, very last trip I took, the break, sorry, right before COVID shut us down, um, I was in Mali, Niger, and Tunisia. And, you know, there are major, major problems there in terms of stability in various different issues groups that are taking advantage of it. Bill over from Libya, all manner of issues. So containing that and making sure that that transnational threat um, doesn't further disrupt the region, doesn't spread to Europe, doesn't spread to the U.S., is a huge challenge. And mixed in with all of this, you know, is, is that competition with China and Africa. We're trying to build relationships. They're trying to undermine us. Um, and there's a ton of different specific examples. Um, I'll just, you know, cite one. You know, Tunisia doesn't leap to mind necessarily to the average person as a place that, you know, is part of what I just described, but it very much is. Um, to begin with, Tunisia is one of the more successful uh, countries that came out of the whole Arab Spring. Uh, but also they, they have threats on both borders coming from Libya and coming from Algeria, uh, from terrorist organizations. And China is very keenly focused on trying to build an alliance with Tunisia, quite frankly, long term with the eye towards potentially getting a base on the Mediterranean out of it. Um, we at the time, I'm not sure if this is still true, it was about a year ago, well, you know, almost a year, not quite a year ago now. Um, you know, we, have, we have a small contingency in Tunisia working with them on counterterrorism issues. Uh, helping train and also help helping train them, you know, deal with counterterrorism and then helping to train them on the equipment that we have sold them, a uh, couple drones and some other issues. That's a good way to sort of build a relationship. And that's, you know, a real value add that I think the U.S. brings to the country. Um, I glanced at the Q&A and so there's already a question about, you know, what's the difference between what we're trying to do in Africa what we're providing Africa and what China's providing Africa. There's a whole bunch of different pieces to that question. But one of our greatest assets is our security expertise. The equipment that we sell to people in Africa works better, lasts longer, and the guidance and support that we give them is more robust and better. And they recognize that. Um, they buy stuff from China, a piece breaks a month later, they don't have the repair part, and it sits in, sits in a hangar somewhere not doing anything. So we have an opportunity to build the relationships necessary to deal with all of the broader issues in Africa, you know, through our mill to mill relationship and through the security cooperation that we provide. A um, bunch of different layers there, but I'll stop there and uh, give General Waldhauser a chance to, to share his expertise. Congressman Smith, thanks very much for that. I, I just at the outset want to say uh, something real quick, if you don't mind, you know, it was a pleasure to work with you and and Congressman Thornberry for the years that we were there. And uh, uh, most people don't know this, but when the elections took place in the fall of 2018 and you became, uh, became the chairman of the committee, I think AFRICOM was one of your first hearings that you had. And we sat there with you. And I, I, one of the, you did two things that were very, very unique that I don't think uh, really people really understand. And the first one was 
Um, you had a, a policy person from OSD come with uh, myself and General, Bo uh, General Botel to testify before you, and I was a little bit skeptical about that, but at the end of the day, it would really made a lot of sense, and I think made the hearing far more worthwhile because we don't make policy we're in the uniform side, and the, the civilians do, and I thought that was a good mix. And then the second thing you did, which was very unique in that hearing, all the freshman congressmen who were there, you had them go first. And uh, I think that just was a big uh, shot in the arm for them. You could tell their enthusiasm and they were trying to ask, uh, you know, good questions and so forth. So I just wanted to, you know, I never got a chance, I don't think, to thank you on that. But that was a very unique thing and a, uh, very much uh, appreciative of all that. Look, I'd say three or four things at the outset to, to kind of compliment, to try to compliment what the congressman said. Um, first of all, you know, the, the whole counterterrorism piece in Africa certainly is a large part of what we do. Uh, but I think it's important to really understand that we always come back to the fact that Really, the military is there to support the diplomatic effort. And you look at the various strategies that have come out of the, this administration over the last three years, whether it's the national security strategy, the, uh, the national defense strategy, uh, the White House strategy for Africa, these really are all designed to, to, to provide uh, support for a diplomatic effort. Now, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that, but I think that's a very, very important point. Second thing I would make is that, you know, one of the challenges, you talk about challenges for Africa from a strategic sense is, the challenge that we have uh, to, to tell the American people of why Africa is important to us. I mean, this is a fair question and something that, you know, I would get asked all the time. Uh, and I'm not sure I did very well at, at answering that. But when you look at some of the priorities, whether it's uh, in those strategies, or really if you look at the State Department priorities that uh, Tibor Naj just set into motion when he took over as the Assistant Secretary, it's important that the military arm understand those and then incorporate those points into whatever military strategy or campaign plan that they have. And I guess the final thing I would say, you know, we could spend a lot of time talking about the Chinese on here and, and Congressman Smith did a great job in, in his points. But I would just say one thing, uh, I think the starting point for whatever we're gonna do uh, on the continent to continue on with the, the competition, if you wanna call that is, you've gotta do things like the Secretary of Defense did this past week. He personally visited in Tunisia, Morocco and Algeria sign some agreements that put 10 years of training, et cetera, back on the table. This is a huge, uh, huge thing to the Africans, that personal relationship. And the Chinese do a very, very good job of senior leadership coming and just establishing a relationship, not necessarily for a transactional piece early on, but just the partnership, the relationship. And these visits that uh, the Congressman talked about with his delegation, these CODELs and staff DELs that come through the continent, I can't underscore how important they are. But again, my point would be is that one of the ways that we need to get at the issue of influence, whether it be the Chinese or the Russians, is we've got to start to develop a, a quality relationships with our key leaders uh, on the continent. Because at the end of the day, the Africans don't want to be in the middle of us versus them or have to choose. But uh, relationships are a big part of that. And I think that's something somewhere we can uh, work on to make progress. Um, we talked about the level of military force or the in the uh, African continent, uh, is the current level of US, U.S. military force deployed in Africa uh, adequate to, to counter the threat of terrorism and insurgency? And do you both believe that we are striking the appropriate balance between military force and diplomatic uh, initiative? John, John, you can go ahead and take the lead on this one if you want. Well, let me just to try to begin by saying that Africa is a large place. We all understand that and know that. And when we talk about why is Africa important, really what follows from that is what level of effort then does that mean to the United States, whether that be military presence, whether it be uh, security programs and the like, what level of effort with regards to the other uh, uh, priorities that we have for national security. So that's always a, an issue. You know, in the national defense strategy, which uh, came out early in the administration, um, you know, one of the things that AFRICOM was told in there is that you can expect to get uh, no more increase or perhaps even less with regards to assets, et cetera, support for the continent. So that's understandable. That's just part of it. There's no doubt about, uh, no, no doubt about that, that you have to work within uh, what you have. You have to ask for what you need, but at the same time, knowing full well that there really are other higher priorities with regards to national security. So from a COCOM perspective or a former COCOM perspective, and I, I know that the Congressman understands this, there's not a combatant commander that would come, we come before his committee to say he has everything that he needs. But at the end of the day, we have to make sure that we're working with our partners, whether that be, you know, the French uh, in the West, 
whether that be with Amazon uh, in Somalia, uh, whether that be uh, in Libya with all that's going on there, it's important that we work and support them. Uh, so, you know, at the end of the day, our level of effort's got to be tied to the priority that we have uh, on the African continent. Yeah, I think that there's two parts of that that I would focus on building off of what uh, the general said. You know, number one, we can't look at Africa in a vacuum. And I know Secretary Esper is particularly bent out of shape about the fact that people are always, you know, yelling at him about everything he's not doing. And, and then, okay, well, if you want me to do more here, I have to do less someplace else. There's a, there's a finite amount of resources. And if the whole focus is on great power competition and what are we going to do with Russia and Eastern Europe and, and China in Southeast Asia, um, you know, he's trying to make all of those assets work. Um, it's a legitimate point. Now, it's also a legitimate point that great power competition is absolutely happening, as we've already alluded to, in Africa. And if that's your focus, you need, you need to be aware of it. But you also, you know, we have a limited number of assets. We cannot simply dominate every corner of the world with our presence. So we've got to make choices. But then that leads into the second point that, that General Waldhauser already made, the importance of allies and partners. If we look at any place in the world and say, well, we got to do it on our own. We got to put enough forces, whether, frankly, whether it's diplomatic or military, whatever it is, if we think that we just, on, on the strength of our own power, um, are going to get our way in a given part of the world, this is not going to happen. What we have to do is we have to find partners and alliances. And, and certainly, you know, that starts with finding partners in Africa. And I think we have been really successful. And this was something that struck me way back in 2007 when I was chairing the, the terrorism subcommittee and working with SOCOM a lot. You know, at the time, we had roughly you know, a little north of 200,000 troops on the ground in Iraq and Afghanistan and, and going through some pretty, pretty tough fighting uh, and heavy sledding. Meanwhile, in the Horn of Africa and bleeding over into Yemen, um, we were dealing with a pretty significant problem there, too. AQAP was up and moving. Somalia had been a problem for a long time. Yemen, you know, with Anwar al-Awlaki was sort of at the center of, you know, some of the transnational plots that were coming out, you know, the, the underwear bomber in Detroit, um, the efforts to place bombs on um, uh, package uh, planes. Um, and we didn't have 200,000 troops in the Horn of Africa, I forget the exact number, but, you know, putting aside, you know, since the, the base in Djibouti distributed around that general area, we had a fairly small number, but what we had was really good partnerships with Kenya uh, in particular, but also Ethiopia, uh, Uganda, um, you know, Djibouti, obviously. You know, we, we worked with partners in the region to achieve our goals. Uh, in West Africa, we're, we're trying to do that right now, primarily with the French. Um, it doesn't always have to be US boots on the ground to solve a problem. We build the relationships so that we can leverage those partnerships and leverage those assets. Um, I think that's going to be the key to meeting our needs in Africa, not necessarily obsessing about exactly how many troops we have on the ground. Uh, we just had a situation uh, two weeks ago with some horrific flooding in East Africa and a significant number of casualties. I wondered if uh, the congressman and the general could address uh, the issue of climate and its impact on uh, security within Africa and uh, the strategic relationship we have with the African nations. And I, it's huge. It's, I'm sorry. Um, it, go ahead, General. Well, thank you. Thank you, Congressman. No, what I would just say briefly is there's just no doubt about that this is a huge challenge. I mean, there are all kind of examples that we could give from, from the, the growth of the transition zone in the Sahel as it moves south and the grazing land uh, becomes less and you have problems with farmers and herders and all that that brings with it. Um, this is a huge problem. You can get out uh, to the east with food insecurity, not, not the least of which is locusts and the like. Um, th th there's no doubt about the fact that the, that the, the changes in the environment are putting pressure on, uh, you know, various groups that may, that have led and can continue to lead to, to conflict. I mean, Lake Chad is another example now since 1960 or so, you know, that's, it's been reduced by 90%. Now that's not all climate. There's some bad uh, decisions made there with regards to how to use that water and so forth. But the fishing there, for example, is not what it once was. So you can look at the map, look at the ground, and see where these are having an impact. And, and, and it's difficult. See, we haven't really hit the, the theme yet of good governance 
because at the end of the day, we always say this, you know, there are, there are no military solutions for the most part for these challenges. We can assist, whether that be in a place like Somalia or be in a place like West Africa, but they're not military solutions. And so um, this is something that you have to be aware of and, and, and make sure that you have strong security environments so that the government can take care of the issues when the farmers and the herders in, in Northeastern uh, Nigeria, for example, start to have conflict over how to control their land. It's a very, very critical subject. Yeah, and I think the whole of government approach um, and how we go at this, you know, building, building resiliency within governance and, and partnering with um, the African nations to get there. I mean, I think the, the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation was one of the key thing that we did. And people asked me about, you know, what, what did George W. Bush do that I liked uh, being a Democrat? And there's actually quite a few things, but that's the one I always cite first. Um, his commitment to Africa was incredibly important. And the idea behind the, the MCC was to work with various nations to develop compacts on overall governance, um, to improve, you know, rule of law, education, public health. Uh, we haven't talked much about public health yet, but I think that, that, that too is crucial. Um, the involvement, you know, in the case of some private organizations like the Gates Foundation, working with Africa to deal with um, Ebola and malaria and various other health concerns on the continent. And in fact, I just I spoke with the um, with General Townsend, the African Com commander, just yesterday, and we talked a little bit about COVID. And the reaction in Africa was, okay, one more thing that can kill us. Um, you know, they're they're kind of used to that, so they're they're dealing with a lot of those issues. So moving forward on the public health side can get us there too. Climate change absolutely having a huge impact. Um, you got to adjust and deal with it because we're you know, even if we adopted all the right policies today, it, we wouldn't stop it. it. It's something we are going to have to be aware of and how it impacts the, the resources and lives on the continent. Matt, if I may just follow on to that just for a second. I mean, what this discussion reemphasizes is that, you know, there, the U.S. has developmental priorities on the African continent. And it's important that the military side of this understand that. And so when you look at things like, you know, gender equality, for example, I, you know, I do some work with a group called... Uh, uh, girl security, which is a nonprofit, uh, nonpartisan issue that tries to take young girls and women and, and get them involved in national security as a career. It's important that we do that. So, so, so for example, their AFRICOM had a very, very strong uh, women peace and security program, which the Africans have a demand for. So it's a developmental priority, of course, you know, gender equality, but it's a way that the military tool can get involved and support that, that diplomatic effort. This is what's so very, very important. And this is why the whole government approach that the Congressman mentioned is important that everybody's kind of rowing in the same direction. It's a very, very important to understand the priorities of USAID, the State Department, as well as the DOD uh, objectives for the, the COCOM on the continent. Uh, we have a question from Terrence, Terrence McCulley. Uh, one could argue that the training equipped programs with African mil um, militaries, particularly in the Sahara region, have not been successful. Uh, from the Pan-Sahel Initiative through the Trans-Sahara Counterterrorism Partnership, these programs have not prepared African militaries to successfully counter the various threats they face. Moreover, allegations of human rights abuses by the Nigerian, Malawian, and Bukabi armed forces suggest that human rights training is not part and parcel of our, of our program. How can we make our partnership with African militaries more successful in building capacity to counter the very serious threats from extremists? Uh, while maintaining some commitment and observance of human rights norms. Yeah, I'll just make an observation on that and then turn, turn it over to the show because I, I don't have an answer except to say that my observation is this is something that, you know, back in the early 2000s when, you know, I was on chairing that safety committee and taking a look at this, as I mentioned, I was very impressed by what we accomplished in the Horn, um, the, the partnerships we developed with Kenya and Uganda and elsewhere. And then as things got more problematic in the Sahal, you know, the first thought that occurred to me is we need partners, okay? You know, we can't just plop in there and make this work, so who are we gonna work with? And it, you know, it has not gone well for all the reasons described. And I don't know all the ins and outs of the relationships with Mali and Niger and, um, forgive me, I'm forgetting of Burkina Faso and, and some of the Mauritania and the countries that are there, they've had major governance issues. We've had a, a number of coups that have, you know, upset the government. Obviously that's what sort of, you know, really kicked off a major problem in Mali was when their government collapsed. Um, and, you know, we had a coup and then who do we work with? So 
we need to find better partners in the region is the statement, but that's not terribly helpful. So I will, I'll turn it over to General Waldhauser to maybe tell us how we find better partners in the region. Thanks very much, uh, Congressman. You know, this is a constant challenge, there's no doubt about it. You know, we, uh, not, to, not to just to repeat, but in all these strategies that came uh, our way, one of the constant themes was building partnerships, building capability, building capacity, and that's really you know, uh, what we need to do to have a secure environment so these problems that we're talking about can be handled within those own governments and so forth. Look, one of the key things is there are some countries, Sahel is probably a good example, and I won't name specific countries, but you, know, you give them 55 brand new up-armored Humvees, and six months later, they're all broken, can't, don't work, and so on and so forth. On the other hand, you have countries like Morocco and Kenya where the military sales, which is not really an AFRICOM uh, you know, line of effort, but the bottom line is they, we sell them jets and tanks and helicopters and they, they do just fine. So tied to all of this with regards to military equipment has to get back to the thing of good governance, education, um, institution building, which becomes very, very important. So it's, a, it's also a, a key that we don't overwhelm these type of countries by giving them so much stuff that they don't have the logistical tail, uh, the infrastructure again to, to maintain it and supply it. Uh, the rule of law is a challenge, but I will say that we make a great uh, effort in all of our training to ensure that rule of law and you know the, how to behave on the battlefield, if you will, is uh, incorporated into all of this. It's a constant challenge, there's no doubt about it. Uh, there's been some successes, there's been some failures with regards to the, the behavior of, a, of, these of some of these armies. But we always like to say that, you know, you, if uh, an army is entering a village, if the mothers take their children and lock the gates and shut the door, that's not a good sign. If the mothers let the kids go out and talk to the soldiers and so forth, then, you know, that's what we're after. And, and so, yes, is it, is it a challenge with equipment? Absolutely. But at the same time, if we're going to expect groups like the G5 Sahel to take on the ISIS West Africa challenge, you know, in the Niger, Burkina Faso, uh, Mali, you know, area in there, uh, they do have to have some equipment. They, they can't just do it on their own. So uh, it's something that uh, we have to watch. We, we, I know that we've worked closely with the State Department in some cases, this case was in Somalia actually, where we actually stopped the funding and stopped the, the equipment coming until they could demonstrate that they could account for it. So there's a, it's, it's a challenge, there's no doubt about it, but I would underscore the fact that the rule of law side of this is something that is we, 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 we stick with, we, we go after, but it's a, it's a challenge on the African continent, no doubt. Um, to both the Congressman and the General, how should the United States approach political instability in West Africa, particularly the Sahel, where the risk of coups is ever present, yet counterinsurgencies uh, remain? I'm um, insurgencies uh, remain. Yeah, again, I don't I don't have a brilliant answer to that. Um, you know, you well, in the immortal words of Don Rumsfeld, you fight with the army you have. Um, you, you work with who you have to work with. I mean, look, I, I would say that part of it is, you know, point, sorry, I forget if uh, General Waldhauser made this point or General Towson made this point yesterday. Relation, I think you did, John. It, relationships are enormously important. You know, if, if high ranking people come in and can build those relationships, um, you know, then we, then we have to work in the way that General Waldhauser described on trying to build resiliency within that government. But you know, it, it is a difficult, unstable region. Um, security is not easily achieved. I mean, right now, if you look at, you know, I was only in two of the countries, but Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, outside of the capital, they really don't have much control. Um, so you've got a lot of instability. Whoever happens to be running those countries, as you know, we just had a coup in Mali not long ago. Um, whoever's running it is mostly focused on survival. Um, so how, how do you build up that capacity? I mean, I could walk you through the basic steps we, we have in this call already, you know, on the whole of government, you know, get the rule of law in place, but you got to have people to work with. Um, and that, that is increasingly, well, not increasingly, continually difficult in, in that region. And I wish I had a better answer than that. I don't, I don't have any really better answer. I, I would just say that um, you know, one of the reasons why the African countries want to train and want to have U.S. equipment is because of the standards that we demonstrate, the value-based standards. So, I mean, not to be overdramatic on this, but when U.S. service members, men and women, 
train, whether that be in the medical arena, whether that be lawyers train their legal experts, whether that be infantrymen training in those skills, U.S. soldiers are committed uh, to, the, to the betterment of those armies. And it's, it, you can tell it in their work. And so that's one of the reasons why, just from that particular point of view, they want to have uh, U.S. involvement with U.S. training. Uh, when it comes to equipment, they always uh, would rather have U.S. equipment. But, you know, our system is a little bit different. We sometimes have use end user requirements and maybe take a little longer. So sometimes they'll go different directions. They'll go to the Chinese. They'll go to the Russians. But if, if it can be done, they certainly will want to go to U.S. effort equipment. Mali is a unique place. The Congress mentioned the recent coup. It's the second coup in the last, uh, you know, whatever it is, 15, 20 years. Uh, there was a little bit of discussion about this the leader who had been in, who led the coup had been in Russia prior to that, and he'd been training in some of our exercises. I mean, that's not, uh, you know, that's not surprising. I mean, I'm, you know, we, we try uh, in our exercises to, to, to work with countries, even when, even when we're under restrictions by law, uh, when a coup takes place, you have to really stop things. And in Mali, just as a one quick example, I mean, the Mali, Mali wanted more from us than I think we were able or perhaps willing to give as a result of some of their history. But we did work with the ambassador there and set up a program of various training exercises and so forth with the, the country of Mali, even though uh, their history was something uh, that uh, you know, repeated itself here recently. You have to stick at it. Um, some of these organizations, as I said, G5 Sahel is one example. Um, these are soldiers that are going to try to solve the African problems. And you know, we, we, need to, we need to help them do that. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna be uh, out there with all kinds of effort and all kinds of numbers of people, but our, our participation as the United States is very, very critical and very, very important. We have a question from uh, William Solly from uh, Senator Kuhn's office. Um, you, all, you both discussed great power competition with China and Africa. Could you comment on how the United States is responding to Russian adventurism in Central Africa, uh, particularly the, the Wagner Group in Central African Republic? Yeah, I've, I've talked a little bit. The dominant thing we're trying to do, and I've met with the Central African Republican uh, Republic leader, um, and we try to tell them not to take it. And this is this is this is a dilemma that we have, um, and not just in Africa. We are trying to, you know, make sure, or we're trying to push every country we can away from relying on China and Africa for military equipment, or in the case of the Central African Republic and also in Libya. Russian mercenaries um, who are sprinkled into a variety of different countries throughout Africa. We basically, you know, we don't want them to accept that help. And then they come back to us and say, okay, if we're not going to take this, what do you got? And then we've got the Leahy law and we've got, you know, all this Leahy rule and other things about why we can't provide them the security assistance that they're asking for. And those reasons are you know, legitimate. Um, you know, we, we don't want to give equipment to people who are going to misuse it and abuse it. We don't want to give people equipment, as the general pointed out, who don't know how to use it. So it's just going to rot in a corner somewhere. Um, nor do we want to plop down, you know, a couple thousand U.S. troops and have them serve as, you know, mercenaries for whatever country in Africa. You know, but if we can't provide the security that they're asking for and Russia's in there providing it, you know, that, that's going to be a problem. I would say the, the answer I give is the best we can do is try to build the relationships with the individual countries so that they don't see that as a, a reasonable option for their needs. Uh, I just but pick it, up on that last point that Congressman sure. Smith made. That was the big concern for us, that others, not only around the region there, but throughout the continent, would see that model as perhaps something that they may want to pursue. You know, the, the, the Russians, they, they've... You know, they, extraction rights. They've got a, they at least had a, a personal advisor to the president. Um, this is a model that is not helpful. And that's the big concern as Congress Smith mess. And we don't want to see that as something that, uh, that these other countries perhaps in that area would aspire to. Um, do, the, do you both uh, believe that the development finance that is currently underway is going to be able to, in the future, successfully uh, counter the predatory lending of the Chinese? Well, not successfully counter. It's important that we do it. And I think it has been helpful and, and successful. And, 
Let me also say that you know, if China is spending money up with development in Africa, there's at least part of that that's a positive. Again, in Niger, you know, it's there. They only, they only had one bridge across the river. You know, China built one and was in the process of building the second one last February when I was there. Um, you know, some infrastructure support from China can be, can be a positive. We're not going to stop China from doing that. And to think that we can outcompete them, I think, is a mistake. We have to maintain our presence, you know, build relationships, offer that, that, those services where we can. I think it's also, and we've, we've done this diplomatically, also work with African countries to not fall into the debt trap from China, to make sure that what they're getting from China is truly helpful to them and not just an excuse for China to bring in Chinese labor, do the work, get people in debt. Uh, and, and put them under their thumb. I think we can definitely help them negotiate better goals and be aware of how they might be taken advantage of. But we're not going to stop China from doing the development that they're doing on the continent. Well, that's a great answer, Congressman Smith. I can't really add anything to that. Uh, there's a question from uh, John Madeira. Uh, thus far, we've had a considerable discussion about military and security assistance, but how does economic development assistance play into the strategic partnership with the African states? Have recent steps taken by USG, the Build Act, Development Finance Commission, et cetera, been successful, uh, or is it too early to tell? Um, I, I think those programs, some of them, which I'm not an expert in though, I think it's kind of too early to tell. I think what's important is some of these initiatives that this administration had started need to be, uh, need to be followed through with. There's gotta be some money and resources put towards that. Uh, the Millennium Challenge Program, the PEPFAR program, there's other, you know, programs that, are, that have been historically um, well-received and well-funded and it have really had significant impact. But I think as we look down the road here, I think that, you know, we're going to need to figure out a way to message this uh, support uh, better on the African continent. I mean, one of the things that, uh, you know, Tibor Naj always was, was very um, adamant with me about was that uh, this youth bulge we haven't really talked much about it, but I suspect the audience has a good idea of the, the demographics and so forth on the African continent. But this youth bulge is something that I don't know that we've really um, explored in terms of how we want to try to message that and how do we want to get them, you know, uh, to really understand what the United States can do for them in the future. I agree totally. We're never going to, you know, out finesse, if you will, China, what they do. But, you know, on one hand, there's numerous examples. Uh, just one in Kenya where they bought some equipment from the Chinese, but then they, they wanted to give it back because it didn't work. I mean, there's roadways and bridges that have simply fallen apart from the Chinese. I mean, in, early on uh, in this administration's tenure, uh, Secretary Tillerson visited there, and this was a discussion that people at the African Union, you know, took a little bit of offense to when, you know, we, they, if they thought that we were trying to tell their leadership how to run their countries. I mean, they're going to have to make some decisions uh, with regards to the, the debt trap economics and that type of thing. But at the end of the day, we have to stick, stick with it. We have to make sure that our message is clear. We have to show that if we want to be, and I, I can't come up with a better term, but if we want to be the, the partner of choice, uh, you know, then we have to demonstrate that through our actions. And I think at the same time, some of the pro, you know, one of the reasons why we perhaps don't poll that well on the African continent when you get in these individual countries is the Chinese build wrestling stadiums, they build malls, they build soccer stadiums. You know, meanwhile, you know, we're, we're uh, I think in Niger as an example, we have a Millennium Challenge program that is, you know, dealing with irrigation in farming fields and so forth. So there, and then on the other hand, you know, there are places where we have, you know, missiles that come out of the sky into their country. So we have a messaging problem that we have to, to, to deal with and understand because we do spend a lot of money on the African continent and we do give a lot of support. But at the same time, it's not overt, it's not seen every day by the lo local populations. And, sometimes, and the Chinese know how to exploit that because they give uh, to these various countries, you know, what they really need and what they're looking for culturally and so forth. Oh, this is the last I'm going to, okay, okay good. Do you want to do one last question, Matt? Yeah, yeah one last question from uh, Joe Gould. Uh, the Pentagon at one point uh, looked to draw down the U.S. military presence in Africa, but that seems to have run aground because of opposition from Capitol Hill. Has the Pentagon backed off that also for General Waldhauser and Chairman Smith? Uh, what's the potential impact of moving AFRICOM from Europe uh, as the administration appears to be planning? Yeah, let me take the second one first. Um, uh, I guess the easiest answer on the moving of the, uh, Trump's gonna lose and we're not gonna move the, the we're not, we're not gonna move AFRICOM out of Germany. 
Okay, because the only reason they're even talking about moving AFRICOM out of Germany is because the commander in chief decided that we had to get 12,000 troops out of Germany and they couldn't do it um, without, moving Af without moving the location of AFRICOM. They're never really serious. They have no idea where they want to move it to. They're, they're babbling a little bit about Italy. All they know is the president wanted 12,000 troops out of Germany and they couldn't make the math work unless they moved that, that command. It's, it's a remarkably boneheaded idea. Um, and we will kill it one way or the other. So it's going to stay in, in Germany where, where it's at because it just doesn't make sense um, to do that. On the larger issue, people have to, I gave a little bit of this answer earlier, but the, the whole discussion, what, 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 what Mark Esper is focused on is trying to make the money work at the Pentagon. At the end of the day, he's very much a bean counter or accountant sort of approach. And, and I think it's very positive is the, the politics that he's having to deal with are beyond the skills of even the most deaf politician. Um, and it's not his bailiwick. What he wants, he's looking at, okay, I got this amount of resources, this amount of money, this amount of stuff. Here's the mission. How do I make this mesh? It doesn't mesh. He and I bond over something that General Waldhauser alluded to earlier, where, you know, every hearing I swear I'm at, someone, you know, when they're advocating for one program or another says, well, you know, only 30% of the needs for the, you know, combatant for the CENTCOM commander were met last year. Well, nobody ever meets the needs of the combatant commanders, all right? If they hit 50%, it's a blessed miracle. And if people go, oh my gosh, you know, we're not meeting their needs, but you no, know, look, maybe, maybe they're asking for crap they shouldn't be asking for. Uh, we don't have it, okay? Would we like to have a $3 trillion defense budget? I suppose. I'd like to have a beach house on Maui, all right? You know, you've got the resources you've got, and then you play with them. So what Esper tried to do, God bless him, was to take a logical look at this and say, all right, here's all the stuff that you're telling me that I'm not doing that I have to do. Yeah, okay, I'm going to try to do it. So if I'm going to do that, I got to cut somewhere else in order to do that. And we're going to do it ec ecumenically. Um, you know, we're going to look at every command. We're going to look at every service. You know, we call it night court, call it a bottom-up review, whatever it is. It's anyone who's run an office, Matt, I know you've run a law firm, so I'm sure at one time or another you go, okay, where the hell are we spending our money? Um, and let's take a hard look at it and say, okay, can we cut this position? Can we do that? That's what Esper did, all right? And alphabetically, he started with Africa. Um, and you've been being told that, you know, okay, we've got all these needs elsewhere, so he imagined a world where, okay, maybe we can cut our resources in Africa uh, in order to meet those other needs. And then, yeah, I, I have a particular interest in Africa. I'm very fo focused on the fact that in Africa, for a very, very small foot, we get a lot of bang for the buck. Let's put it that way. Small footprint, big return. So let's, let's protect that. Um, you know, Jim Inhofe, how much should I say here? Let's just say that Jim Inhofe also cares about Africa. He cares about Africa for different reasons that I find a little odd and troubling in some ways, but he cares about Africa, okay? Um, and so, you know, he got, you know, got on the wrong side of both committee chairmen right out the door on the bottom-up review. It, but it wasn't, it wasn't the Pentagon going, we're tired of Africa, we don't care about it, it's not important. That wasn't the issue. The issue was, as I always like to say, you know, 10 pounds of manure in a five pound bag. That analogy never goes over well, but it is a perfect analogy for how government tries to function. You know, we got all these demands and blah, it's got to fit in here and it's not going to. So I, I don't think there's going to be a dramatic drawdown in Africa, but they haven't stopped talking about it because they're trying to rationalize a budget where they're asked basically to produce, I don't know, north of a trillion dollars worth of goods for $740 billion. And they're trying to rationalize that. And it's not easy to do. Sorry for the lengthy answer there, but that I think is really important to understand what's going on there. Look, I have nothing else to say. <laughs> well, I want to thank both General Waldhauser and, and Congressman Smith for you know a very, very informative and open and great discussion. So thank you very much. Thank you for your, your, your involvement today, but thank you more deeply for your, for your profound service to this country. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate it. General, great, great to see you again. Look forward to working with you. Yes, sir. Thanks very much. Thanks, Matt. Thank you both. It, let, I think that that's a, a round of applause on Zoom, however we do that. But uh, it, was, it was excellent. Always good to get the, the unfiltered uh, Congressman Adam Smith 
uh, on there. And, and I think that was important to, to hear that and, and hear how that all goes. Uh, we're going to go right ahead and, and move into our panel here. And so, you know, we don't even have to change seats like we used to do in, uh, when we were in person. Um, Matt, thank you for, for a great job moderating. Uh, I'll briefly introduce our other two panelists here, uh, Ambassador Johnny Carson and Lauren Blanchard. Uh, Ambassador Carson is a, a real treasure in the American Diplomatic Service with over 40 years in, uh, in, of diplomatic experience, um, ending as, as Assistant Secretary of State for the Bureau of African Affairs, um, and just tours of duty throughout the, the continent. But uh, I, I would go back to, to where it started as a Peace Corps volunteer in Tanzania from 1965 to 1968. Um, Ambassador Carson, thank you for being with us. And then Lauren Blanchard is a specialist in African affairs with CRS. Uh, and she has also worked throughout the continent with USAID and uh, as legislative assistant in the Senate. Uh, we are honored to have her with us as well. Lauren, thank you for being with us. Thanks for having me. Well, I, I think uh, I took some notes as we went through all of the, the uh, conversation there and, and a couple of the themes that, that came up for me were great power competition, uh, climate change is a huge problem in Africa, uh, and uh, capacity building, capacity building, capacity building. Um, I think those, those are a good place for us to start, um, but maybe Lauren, if you wanna take a, uh, take a, a quick shot at, at what, what your takeaways were and, and where we go from here. Thanks. Um, you know, I think there has been a lot of conversation uh, in the past couple of years about this concept of uh, great power competition. I mean, I think it's useful, um, particularly as we're talking about East Africa to sort of broaden the aperture and talk about uh, global power competition, right? Um, we're having a lot of conversations, particularly this year about um, the Red Sea arena. Uh, and, and there we're talking about um, not just competition between you know, notionally China and the United States, um, a little smattering of Russia uh, here and there, but also competition in this region among other uh, global powers or regional powers. So you've got uh, the Gulf states uh, and their Middle East rivals, Turkey, Qatar, um, you know, increasingly engaged in the Horn in East Africa. Um, India is expanding its engagement. Uh, European countries, uh, Germany has been very, very active in uh, engaging um, in support of tran the transitions in uh, Sudan and Ethiopia. Um, you're seeing uh, Korea, um, Taiwan. Taiwan just, uh, yeah. you know, established a representative office in Somaliland. Um, so, so there are a number of countries that are looking at this region as an area of strategic opportunity. And, and some of that um, is, is driven by, of course, the importance of, of the Red Sea, um, which is, you know, obviously a major uh, international trade uh, corridor. Um, but this is also a very dynamic region. I think we're probably going to talk about this and, and Johnny will yeah. speak well to it. But um, two major transitions, I would say three, I think we forget about Somalia being a country in transition as well. But um, yeah. the transition that's going on in Ethiopia, um, sputtering and going through a bit of a, a troubled spot right now, you know, is, is potentially game changing for the region. This is a country of over 100 million people. Uh, the transition that's going on in Sudan after the fall of Omar al-Bashir last year um, could be huge if it's successful. Um, it could also be huge if it is unsuccessful in, in, a, in a not so uh, positive way. Um, there's a lot going on, you know, in, in some of the other countries in the region, uh, Kenya in the midst of uh, free trade agreement uh, negotiations with the United States, uh, very dynamic, a number of big elections going on. So there's a lot going on. There are a lot of uh, countries that are looking at this region. Um, and I think General Waldhauser said something that, um, that I was happy to hear uh, a former US <laughs> official say, um, and this is that Africans don't want um, to be treated, East Africa doesn't want to be treated like a chessboard. 
Um, you know, President Kenyatta was in the United States uh, just before everybody sort of went on lockdown. And he made a speech at the Atlantic Council that I thought was really interesting. Uh, and I think he spoke for a lot of African uh, leaders and African uh, publics, you know, and he sort of talked about how um, East Africa in particular was, it was a battleground during the Cold War, a proxy battleground. Uh, and, and many of these countries um, were seriously changed as a result of it. There were wars fought, um, you know, sort of spurred by some of the Cold War relationships. Um, they don't want to go back there. Um, they, uh, I, to look back at Kenyatta's uh, talk, you know, he said, we don't want to be forced to choose. We want to work with everybody. And of course, you know, they want the benefit of trade and development assistance and humanitarian assistance and all of the different relationships that they can have with the United States. But they also want the investment that China can bring and the trading opportunities. Um, and so um, I think, you know, it's important for us as we're thinking through things in Washington to keep in mind that perspective. Uh, in terms of how how Africans are seeing this uh, competition. In the yeah, region. good. Uh, that's a great great point, Lauren. Uh, Ambassador Carson, in your uh, you know thinking back to perhaps your time uh, going well back to uh, your time serving in Africa and, and on African affairs during the Cold War, are we is all this talk of great power competition? just going back to the bad old days of that? Or is this something uh, different that we're seeing now? Is it substantially and significantly different when we talk about great power competition now? I think that, thanks very much. It's a pleasure to be with uh, all of you this afternoon. Let me start with that question on, uh, on great power uh, rivalries. Uh, I think the Are we losing you for a second here? Uh, we should. Ambassador, we've lost you for a second here. Maybe Matt, we can we can turn you okay. turn over to you. Or is it um, me? Okay, I, I don't want to pitch in for the ambassador, but yes. <laughs> is it is it on my end or uh, yeah? It must be on on his end. Matt, uh, you know your experience is is different, but but I think equally as important. Thinking through the um, the kind of direct person to person relationship building and, and building your, your, your time building educational experience and uh, direct, uh, direct aid with, with uh, in, in the East Africa, Kenya area. Um, what have well, you seen I, there? Well, I mean, we, we've had some very enlightening discussions about great power competition, about large scale economic development. Uh, we've not talked about what I perceive to be one of the most important factors, uh, which is social infrastructure. Uh, you know, the greatest independent variable in a uh, developing world is female literacy. It doesn't cost a lot of money, it's not very sexy, but it changes lives, particularly in the rural communities where the women occupy the most important, really they basically do all the work. Uh, and uh, giving girls the opportunity to read you know, solve so many problems at once. It allows them to delay marriage. It gives them some uh, power over the sexual relationships, over their husbands, uh, and it gives them the tools to succeed economically. Uh, and for very, very small invest, you know, investments of money, you can have huge impacts in the changing, uh, in, in changing the, the, the trajectory of the country. Uh, another example is school feeding programs that, that we've done. You know, it costs uh, $2,500 a semester um, you know, school children uh, walk five kilometers to school every day um, and they don't get a meal. And, and if you have a food, uh, uh, they can't go home for lunch. So if you have a school feeding program that children will go to school, uh, oftentimes it provides nutritional support for the students. It may very well be the best meal they get uh, in the day. And third, you provide uh, economic uh, support uh, by employing the women in the villages uh, to, to actually cook the meals. So these kind of more, you know, micro level solutions, I think, uh, need to be part of an overarching U.S. strategy, focusing on really changing the infrastructure and the hearts and minds of the people. We're not going to be able to compete dollar to dollar with China. 
Uh, we're not going to be able to change, you know, huge geo geostrategic uh, developments. But by working, you know, with and, and being sincerely committed to improving the lives of actual people and actual communities for an infinitesimal amount of money that we're spending uh, for military or even large scale infrastructure support, I think we can change the trajectory and history of Africa. And, and I hope that that becomes a commitment uh, in the next administration. I think that's a that's a hugely important point that, you know, too often we think of, you know, the United States government competing with the Chinese government and the Russian government. But in fact, you know, it's the whole of the United States, you know, too often, often people say, oh, whole of government responses. It's actually a whole of society sort of issue where, you know, all of, all of US society can engage and that, that includes businesses, that includes philanthropists, that includes trade, that includes engagement. So, it, it, you know, the, the simple act of, as, as General Waldhauser said, the simple act of showing up is, is incredibly important uh, in Africa. You know, the, uh, it, it's really just kind of going there and showing up and, and being engaged and, and uh, you know, doing the work like, like you, you had done, uh, Matt, there. Ambassadors, uh, uh, we got you back. <laughs> There's never, never a Zoom call that, that doesn't have some sort of glitch. <laughs> yeah. right. You probably moved on, but let me, let me go back and just yeah. reiterate yeah. and yeah. say that, you know, you know, we should not view Africa's relationship uh, through the prism of a great power uh, rivalry. Uh, we should not make this a binary uh, choice in which Africa is forced to make a decision between the United States uh, and China. Uh, we should not draw uh, Africa into a new uh, Cold War. And I agree with uh, Chairman uh, Smith that we should start looking uh, at Africa uh, optimistically uh, and in a more positive uh, fashion before we start looking at the many challenges uh, that the continent faces. Uh, there are no doubt many challenges uh, across uh, Africa, but I think that it is important, very important for us to look at where uh, Africa is today and where it will be in another decade or two or three decades. And I think that starts uh, primarily with the demographics and then followed by the, 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 the economics. Uh, in terms of population, uh, Africa is the uh, youngest and fastest growing continent uh, in the world. Uh, in, the, in the next uh, two and a half decades, we'll see a country like uh, Nigeria, uh, the continent's most populous, overtake the United States as the third uh, most uh, populated uh, country uh, in the world. Uh, over the next uh, 30 or 40 years, uh, we will see extraordinary uh, growth uh, across uh, Africa and across uh, and its importance in the global community uh, will uh, uh, magnify enormously. We need to look at the economics of this and take a, a look at what this means in terms of, uh, of trade, in terms uh, of investment, uh, and in terms of commercial uh, opportunities opportunities that go uh, both ways. Uh, yes, the continent has enormous challenges. We should work with those challenges uh, and help them to deal with it, but we should look at Africa uh, as a potential partner and not look at it simply, uh, as someone said earlier, as a piece uh, on the chessboard. Uh, we need to move away from that Cold War paradigm and start to look at the intrinsic importance of the continent and the intrinsic value and importance of individual uh, African states. Uh, those partnerships, those alliances are absolutely key. And if we don't get them right, uh, we will ultimately be the, the, the loser. We're not going to be able to dissuade uh, African nations from asking for uh, the major infrastructure structure projects uh, that uh, China has provided, nor are we going to be able to put up the resources and money uh, that's necessary uh, to uh, build those uh, projects. And so I think it's, it's quite critical uh, that we take uh, and look at this uh, very, uh, very uh, holistically. 
uh, and uh, and I'll stop right there. There are a lot of things that I heard that were that were very good. Uh, the China part uh, about rivalry, we should uh, disconnect uh, and look at in a slightly different, uh, slightly different fashion. Yeah, I, and I think this this actually leads into a, a question here uh, submitted by Admiral Fallon in our chat here, saying. Uh, in his experience, success measured by U.S. influence, improved health, economic, agricultural, political security, and more in Africa and in everywhere else is dependent on a whole of government engagement. And uh, uh, Lauren, maybe uh, the question is, as we perhaps go into a presidential transition, uh, you know, we're yet again going to have perhaps the, uh, the U.S. government uh, overlooking Africa for a while before it remembers it again. How do we get this sort of whole of government engagement and focus uh, onto the continent and in particular onto East Africa as we're, we're talking about here? You, you laid out why it's so important, but how do we get that whole of government engagement in the United States? I mean, it's a great question. You know, I think there is, um, there has been and continues to be a uh, push from Congress to be engaged there. Um, you've seen this sort of uh, back and forth between the administration and Congress on the aid budget. Um, the aid budget has been, the uh, Trump administration has for a number of years proposed some pretty dramatic uh, cuts to the foreign aid budget for um, globally, but uh, with, with a particular impact on, on Africa. Um, and uh, Congress has pushed back against those cuts and pushed them back up. Of course, we're still sort of seeing the top line coming down. Um, so, so I think you are continuing to see um, a push from, from the Hill on that front. Um, you know, I think African governments are, are going to be pushing this. Um, uh, you know, President Kenyatta, I mentioned, uh, Prime Minister Abiy from Ethiopia has been uh, an increasingly vocal, I think, spokesman on behalf of the continent in the context of um, some of the COVID-related debt relief uh, conversations that are going on. So, so I think African leaders are, are making themselves heard at the G20, some of these other conversations, whether they're getting uh, the response they want is another, is another, uh, another question. Um, you know, I think that there are, no matter which administration um, we've, we've got come, come January and February, there are a number of big developments coming up. Uh, Somalia has got elections coming up, uh, I think in uh, December and January. Uh, Uganda is going to have a very difficult election. Um, these are things that the Trump administration on its way out or its way into a second term or the Biden administration on its way in um, will we'll be dealing with. Um, Ethiopia will be having a major election sometime next year, um, I think in the middle of next year. Um, so, so these are all things, there are, there are a number of big questions for either administration uh, with relation to Sudan as well. Um, so, so a lot of things for uh, the State Department under either leadership to be, to be dealing with. Um, and there are some questions on the aid front and, and um, you know, is there, are we at a point where we start to realign some of the aid? Of course, aid has been, U.S. aid has been heavily focused on health assistance, about 70% of it uh, going to Africa goes to health funding. Um, comparatively less, much, much less, um, is investments in agriculture and economic growth and education and democracy and governance. And um, is it time to sort of re, re, uh, re look at some of those, those formulas? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I think your point earlier, uh, too, about the, the, that these major countries going into transitions, Ethiopia, Sudan, Somalia, uh, it is events that, that Kind of focus the mind and, and help to focus focus in on uh, there. Matt, what do you think uh, as we as we go into transition here, or either to a second second term or new Biden administration? How do we how do we raise this up the flagpole and make sure that um, that people people in the U.S. government care at the right level? Uh, enough to continue to engage and, and support at the level necessary? Well, I think that's a really important concern. If, if there is a change in administration, there's going to be so much uh, resetting that's going on uh, that uh, there's a danger that uh, in the absence of some kind of a cataclysm from Africa, it's just going to get put on the back burner. I think the importance is to rely upon 
uh, individuals in Congress, such as Congressman Smith, such as Senator Coons, and others who have really invested a huge amount of their legislative career uh, toward uh, uh, focusing on African uh, issues, because uh, the, the, uh, otherwise the, the, the trajectory is not going to, it's just not going to be focused, and it needs to be. Uh, the other thing is that there's been discussion about fairly early in the new administration uh, having a, uh, a conference of African leaders in the, in uh, in Washington D.C. And, and, and if indeed that goes forward, you know, in the first uh, you know 100 200 days of, of the administration, I think that would be a, a very good catalyst to uh, both. You know, in order to put on an event like that, um, there has to be so much uh, uh, staff work that by definition you're going to have to get staffed up quickly. But uh, you know. Hopefully, we're not going to be two years into the new administration and won't have all the diplomatic posts to build. That's right. Uh, Ambassador Carson, um, in, in your experience, both, of the, both um, Matt and Lauren talked a little bit about uh, Congress here, and, and it does seem like Congress helps to focus the mind. Uh, in your experience working with Congress, it, what, what's the driver here and how can, we, can, how can we help Congress push engagement here? Let me uh, go back and, and, and add on to both of the previous comments. Uh, I think that for a lot of domestic reasons, if there is in fact a change uh, in November, uh, I think we will see uh, an administration which will probably uh, elevate uh, its interest in activities uh, across uh, the continent. Uh, there will be uh, an effort to uh, rebuild uh, the relationship and uh, resuscitate it uh, with uh, a lot of energy. And that has to do more with uh, domestic politics uh, and with America's uh, broad brand of democracy and good governance. Uh, if, in fact, uh, that happens, I think that you will see, and I don't speak for anyone uh, except myself, I think that you will see a commitment uh, to a number of activities and high-level visits uh, that will serve to energize the relationship. I certainly see uh, a commitment to having uh, an African summit or a democracy summit uh, that will involve African nations. I see uh, the possibilities of a economic and trade uh, summit, similar to the two events that were held uh, during uh, the last four years of the Obama uh, administration. Uh, I see the appointment of a, a high level uh, set of ambassadors uh, across the, uh, the continent, and I see the administration not, not seeking to reduce the budgets of state and aid by 20 or 30 percent, has been the case over the last four years, but in fact an effort to increase uh, those uh, budgets and to put more uh, emphasis on key uh, areas of development. In addition to the Congress, which I think is absolutely important uh, there, and whether it is on the Senate side with uh, Senator Coons and Senator Risch, or whether it is on the House side with uh, Congresswoman Karen Bass uh, and the House Foreign Affairs Committee, I think there are important economic uh, lobbies in Washington that are increasingly pushing for Africa. I think the um, uh, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce and the uh, people who are there are working to strengthen the economic trade relationship. I think we are seeing more activity uh, out of the Corporate Council on Africa. I think the BUILD Act has created uh, the new International Development Finance Corporation, uh, which, uh, will, uh, is, which is starting to, to move forward and I think an important instrument. I think we'll see a revitalization in MCC and strengthening of the MCC uh, role. And I think we'll see uh, a greater interest uh, in corporate America and among constituency groups. Let me round that off by saying, uh, going back to a, another point, uh, not made. And I think that it is 
important as we try to build stronger relationships with Africa that we align ourselves more closely with positions that Africans want to take. And uh, I know that there's been discussion uh, about the U.S.-Kenya free trade agreement, but over the last two years, uh, Africa has in fact taken a dramatic step forward and signed an African free trade uh, agreement. We need to see how we can work to build uh, on this and to uh, move in a direction which is in parallel and not in competition uh, with uh, Africa's treat free trade uh, agreement. We need to start now now and looking at what we will do uh, when uh, AGOA, the African Growth and Opportunity Act, expires uh, in four years' time. We need to begin to look very carefully at the kinds of economic, commercial, and investment relationships that we have with the, uh, the, the continent. And we must do that uh, in parallel and in unison with where Africa wants to go. And finally, I think we need to be aligned with Africa in the international sphere and community. We need to be a part of the World Health uh, Organization, uh, which is valued enormously uh, by uh, Africans. Uh, we need to be uh, a part of, of the Paris Climate Change uh, Agreement. And somebody pointed out uh, you know, the importance of issues related to climate. There's no doubt uh, that Africa uh, is the continent which will be most uh, impacted by climate change and will have the least resources and resilience to deal with it. Uh, and if we were looking globally at what is happening in Africa today, we would see the same parallels that we see in the United States in a different kind of way, just as we are having enormous fires in California, uh, hurricanes and tornadoes and wind and weather events in the south and southeast, Africa is also experiencing dramatic climate changes as we speak today. They're enumerated, I won't get into them, but we need to be a part of, uh, of that uh, side. We need to align ourselves there. And finally, something that we haven't talked about very much at all, and that is the whole aspect of the key to all of this is strengthening democratic institutions, promoting uh, good governance, and rule uh, of law so that societies are, uh, feel that their governments are hearing them and that governments are more responsive to their societies. Uh, addressing some of the key challenges that generate conflict around the continent and addressing some of the issues that continue to keep Africa impoverished. I think that can be done. Yeah, Ambassador, thank you. And, and I, think, I think your point, especially of, of positioning the United States to do things that, that Africans want uh, is, is tremendously important. And, uh, and I, I want to pick up a little bit more on two of those. One is, is the free trade and investment side, but then also is climate. Uh, and it, your call to, to rejoin Paris Accord is, is uh, extraordinarily important and, and some, something that ASP couldn't agree more with you on. Um, but also that uh, the impacts of climate change on Africa uh, are likely to be among the most difficult and dangerous in the world, and, and particularly actually in East Africa as well. You know, you look at the... Um, the uproar over the Grand Ethiopia Renaissance Dam and water sharing rights downstream. Uh, some, and I think, I think rightfully if so, have said that this could be a preview of, of transboundary water rights fights that we could have in the future. And you know, the, the conflicts that we've seen in, in Sudan between you know, herders and ask, uh, agriculturalists and, and other things are, are a harbinger of the, the climate conflicts of the future. Um, Lauren, wh what do you think of, uh, is there a way to align, you know, goals uh, of Africans along these lines and, and on trade with goals that, that the United States has and should have, particularly in this region? 
Yeah, I th this is, I think this is a great direction for the conversation. You know, we started off this event um, with a conversation between Congressman Smith and General Waldhauser focused sort of on the, on the military relationship and the security relationship. Um, and I think in, in Washington, we tend to talk and focus a lot on government to government relationships um, and, and how we are perceived, how the United States is perceived in Africa. It's not just about how governments perceive us, it's about how African publics um, perceive the United States and how we're viewed. Um, and you know, the military to military relationship uh, is important. There's an important role for the United States, I think, in, in uh, trying to support military professionalization and building peacekeeping capacity and uh, helping African governments deal with counterterrorism problems. Um, but as many people say, you know, the, the, um, you're not going to solve the terrorism problem in these countries um, with the military response alone. And I think that's where we get into um, the aspirations of African publics and, and this increasingly young you know, generation, many of whom are um, facing unemployment. You know, economic opportunities are limited in a number of these countries. Um, competition is stiff. Um, when you're thinking about a, you know, many of these countries in East Africa, the median uh, age is 17 or 18 years old. Um, so an incredibly young population um, limited economic prospects, um, they need to see the sort of transformative economic growth that uh, the governments in Ethiopia and, and uh, Kenya have been, have been trying to sort of bring about. And I think increasing trade is an important piece of that. You know, um, U.S.-Africa trade um, dropped, I think, almost in half from last year, first half of last year to the first half of this year. Now, of course, um, that is in the context of COVID and many of these African countries shutting down their borders. Um, but it's going to take a long time for these countries to come back from the economic hit that they've taken. Um, and that is being felt, you know, at the very most basic level with a lot of people going into um, uh, more extreme poverty. Um, but it's going to take a lot of um, sort of focused effort, I think, from the United States to try to figure out how to really um, kickstart the trade relationship uh, and, and sort of help to bring these countries out of, uh, out of the, um, the slide that they're in right now. Matt, what, what should Americans uh, <laughs> writ large be doing uh, to more closely align ourselves with the needs that, that African people say they want? You know, what, what more can, can Americans, not just the government, but, but partially the government, what, what more should we do, be doing to, to actually meet the wants and needs of, of the African public? Well, go there. You know, it's like only 16% of Americans have passports. Um, you know, we have become such an insular people at the same time that we have such a gro global responsibility. Um, I think that uh, that would be a good start. Um, you know, and obviously we'll have to wait till uh, there's a vaccine. But uh, I think that engaging more person-to-person uh, -person interactions, more, you know, welcoming uh, students in, making it easier for students to, to study abroad, all of these kind of personal connections really ring true. I mean, it, you know, it, 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 it happens that Senator Coons was roommates with, uh, with uh, Uhuru Kenyatta in Amherst. Uh, that has significant long-term strategic international significance in the us Kenya relationship. You know, there, there's a whole cohort of, of, of young Africans uh, and young Americans that can, you know, through an exchange program, actually build the kind of relationships that, you know, 20, 30 years, years from now, they, they're gonna be the leaders. I think you know we've really lost sight of that, and, and some of the some of the um, you know early idealism that uh, Ambassador Carson you know typified with his life experience really needs to be you know restored and and and, and promoted. Uh, you know that some of the you know the idea the idealism of the Peace Corps of, and Sergeant Shriver founded it uh, really needs to be resurrected and and uh, in in a positive and 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 uh, person to person kind of direction. I think that's, that, yeah, that's incredibly important. You know, a, as we close up here, um, ASP likes to say that, that we, we think over the horizon, look, look at, for the, the long-term opportunities and, and long-term challenges. Um, Ambassador Carson, what, what's a headline that we should be working towards in say 2025 or 2030 that uh, would, would show What's the, the, the best outcome for, for building a closer relationship between the U.S. and, and, and Africa, U.S. And, and East African nations? What, what more should, should we be doing? And what, what's the headline? What's the, the goal? 
Africa emerges as one of America's most important partners uh, in the economic, commercial, uh, and investment sphere. Uh, and young uh, African entrepreneurs uh, have become the focal point of American investment uh, abroad. Uh, I think that uh, that is uh, the, the headline that is uh, most important, uh, ensuring that uh, Africa uh, emerges and realizes uh, its full uh, economic uh, potential. Plug for the Peace Corps if I could. Yeah, Two please. Other quick thoughts to add on to Matt's concern. Three, uh, double the size of the Peace Corps and continue to live up to the three goals that John F. Kennedy set for it uh, when it was established back in 1963. Build on the YALI program, the Young African Leaders Initiative, one of the most successful innovations uh, put forward by the Obama administration, bringing young professional leaders here uh, to strengthen uh, their management, uh, entrepreneurial skills, as well as to get a better grounding and understanding of the United States. Not just double it, but triple it. It is, in fact, uh, for Africa, what the Fulbright-Hayes program was for Europe uh, after the end of the Second World War. Build out new uh, public-private partnerships with the great tech companies of the United States, and the United States government to create technical hubs around Africa, uh, similar to the importance of American libraries around the continent in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. Mm -hmm. Create yeah. tech hubs uh, that help to drive and promote uh, innovation and uh, creativity. Uh, there are ideas out there. Strengthen uh, our programs uh, in relationship to women uh, and young girls uh, and create uh, programs that specifically uh, underpin uh, the emergence of uh, women uh, as uh, key partners uh, in uh, development across uh, the continent. But the bottom line is, is that uh, we uh, must uh, uh, spend more, uh, do more, uh, to get a better uh, outcome. And if we do that, I think we can, in fact, uh, make uh, great strides in strengthening the partnerships with the continent that we all want, economically as well as politically. It sounds like a pathway toward, towards those, those headlines. Uh, and I think that's as good a place as any to, to close up for the day. First, let me, let me join everybody here in, in thanking our, our panelists here, Lauren Blanchard, Johnny Carson, Matt Bergman, uh, and then thanks especially also to General Waldhauser, Chairman Adam Smith. Uh, I think a great panel. You'll be able to see more of this, including a recording uh, up on the American Security Project website, americansecurityproject.org. Uh, we'll continue to work on the, these important issues and others. Take a look through our website. We're on Twitter at AMSEC Project, uh, Facebook and LinkedIn and everywhere else that you can find stuff. So thank you all. Uh, and, you know, round of applause from the, the Zoom audience here. So <laughs> thank you. And, and thanks to our audience for being thank with you. us as well. Thank you. Thank you.